Well, it's been wonderful to be here, and the hospitality and the warmth that we've received uh, while we're here um, has been amazing, and uh, I just truly appreciate the welcome uh, that we have gotten. Um, if you haven't spent time at the uh, Nate and Leah bed and breakfast, um, then I would encourage you to go ahead and schedule your appointment, uh, because it's a wonderful place to stay. Do it immediately and everybody all at once. Um, <laughs> But I really do appreciate, um, you know, the fact that you guys have welcomed us all in. And, uh, you know, it's when I go back and people ask me how I was received, um, I'm going to be sure to tell them that, well, at Covenant, they show up an hour early to hear the preaching. So, so I do appreciate that, uh, that you were willing to come out after the, the time change. Uh, it's probably one of the most wicked things Satan ever did to us was daylight saving time. But... In any case, um, you can be turning to Jonah, the book of Jonah. Um, we're going to be, the main part that we're going to really focus on is in chapter 4, but we're going to kind of do a quick run through the whole story. Um, I'm not going to read it to you, but it's familiar to many of you. Um, and I, I think Nate confirmed in the earlier service that he has preached it before. Um, so I don't know if anybody remembers that, but I'll, I'll correct all of his errors, don't worry. <laughs> Jonah chapter 4. 1 through 4 is what we're going to look at. Uh, we'll get there eventually, but first I want to read this little interesting factoid to you. Just keep it in the back of your mind. Although the name sounds a little strange, there is a whole family of tropical moths called butterfly moths. Moths of this family, the Cassinidae family, are brightly patterned with colorful hind wings. They fly by day like butterflies or at twilight. Similar to butterflies, they have clubbed antennae, whereas most uh, moths have feathery or thread-like antennae. Some of these moths mimic toxic or distasteful butterfly species, thus gaining protection from predators. Worldwide, there are about 150 species of butterfly moths. So keep that in the back of your mind, and now we're going to move on to the book of Jonah. Jonah lived in uh, the neighborhood of the year 770 B.C., so 770 years before Christ uh, came onto the stage, before uh, the Son of God took on human flesh and was named Jesus. We have Jonah's time. And it was right smack in the middle of the era of the divided kingdom of Israel. So you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And Israel had split after Solomon's reign. And both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah uh, were both knee-deep in a form of kind of generalized apostasy. They hadn't completely separated themselves from worship of Yahweh, uh, but they were letting in a lot of foreign influences. They would worship God at the temple, but then they would also go to other various high places, and they would worship other gods. And so they were allowing foreign influences into their culture, and they were uh, adding it to their worship of God. And what this is called is syncretism. And so if, if we want to, sometimes it's helpful to bring ourselves and the Bible kind of a little bit closer together. The Bible and the context can seem out there, but our context isn't really that much different than Jonah's context in his day. We live in a very syncretistic kind of culture where there are a lot of different ideas that are coming together together. And even within evangelicalism, in, in the mainstream Christian church, syncretism is a real danger that we need to look out for. So our context isn't very different from uh, the context uh, in Jonah's time. And there had been some kings of Israel and Judah who had tried to rein things back in, but that only lasted for as long as that king's influence was there. And as soon as that king was gone, another wicked ruler would come in, and all of those uh, foreign pagan practices would ramp right back up. So syncretism is the combining of attributes of various religions together to form what I call a, a big lumpy mass of, of different convoluted practices. And you might put a label on it that sounds pretty Christian-y, but it's still a foreign practice. And so a good example of syncretism that we experience and a lot of people have fallen into within what is mainline or, or acceptable forms of Christianity is called the New Apostolic Reformation. The New Apostolic Reformation. And many of people may not have heard of the NAR movement, uh, but you may have heard of Bethel Church. Bethel Church is exceedingly popular. Uh, they have their own college that 
uh, teaches young people how they can become apostles and prophets and those sorts of things. And they are a very syncretistic organization at Bethel Church. For instance, Bethel uses tarot cards and calls them destiny cards. So just like you might go to a psychic palm reader and they might use tarot cards to discern your future, uh, at Bethel Church they do the same thing. They just change the name to destiny cards. Uh, they engage in necromancy or attempting to contact and uh, communicate with the dead, except they clean it up and they call it speaking with the saints. Uh, they perform aura readings. So if any of you have ever been out to the Grand Canyon, you've been to Red Rock or Sedona, uh, it's a very uh, new agey kind of area. And one thing that you'll find is plenty of shops that are willing uh, to do an aura reading on you. And they, uh, they measure your spiritual energy with their psychic powers and uh, they discern what your future might hold or what your fifth dimensional self might be like and how you can attain a conversation with your fifth dimensional self. And I can see in my wife's eyes right now, she can't even handle my current dimensional self. She doesn't need any more <laughs> dimensions of Jason to deal with. But she's a lovely woman, and she's very gracious and kind, and I, I'm grateful to God for her. Um, another thing that they do is they attempt to contact spirits, and whether it's angels or demons or whatever it might be, and they call it awakening angels. And so Bethel Church has actually done field trips where they go down to Sedona and they go to the places where there are supposedly interdimensional vortexes, and they try to awaken angels through means of these vortexes. And so they're very active. And then uh, on top of that, they call transcendental meditation. They relabel that as visiting heaven. And this is a hugely popular movement. And a lot of people know the name Bethel Church, but they don't understand everything that Bethel has brought in and that is influencing the people that are under their leadership. And so the point that I'm making with that is that we need to be careful of people that come into the church with different practices, different methodologies, different things under a new name that is really just old school paganism and mysticism and new age religion dressed up in a Christian outfit. And so this is what Jonah was dealing with. Jonah, in, if we're going to kind of try to contextualize it, it would be like Jonah is a sane Christian who God calls out of a Benny Hinn or a Kenneth Copeland crusade to go and preach repentance to ISIS. He's coming out of a wacky kind of religiosity. He is, is close to Jesus, or close to Yahweh. Well, yeah, he's close to God. And God says, because you're one of the better ones in the group, I'm going to pull you out and I want you to go and preach repentance to other people who need to know that I'm here, and I want to draw them near. Now, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which is located in modern-day Iraq, north of, of Israel. And as far as any Israelite person was concerned, Assyria was just the worst. You could not get worse than the people of Assyria because the things that, that they were doing to Israel at the time. And so Jonah himself was from a place called Gath Hefer in Galilee, which is just a stone's throw away from Nazareth, if that gives you an idea of where it is, meaning that he would have been privy, he would have been very uh, familiar with the Assyrian raids from the north down into Israel. Galilee is up in the northern section of Israel. And they would come in, the Assyrians would come in, to kill and pillage and plunder and to torture and terrorize and to take captives back with them back into Assyria to, to act as slaves. But at this point in time, the Assyrian Empire was peculiarly weak. They were in between strong leadership, they were in between strong kings, and they were actually getting pressure from their own northern neighbors who were pressing down and taking their northern border and bringing it closer and closer and closer to their capital city of Nineveh. So at the point that Jonah was called to go and preach to Assyria in, in their capital city of Nineveh, the, the border had been pressed down to within about 100 miles of their capital city. So if you can imagine the Canadians launching an assault on the northern United States and pressing down all the way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with their eyes on Washington, D.C. That's how close they were. They were right on the horizon. They could see them coming. I know it's hard to imagine Canada doing that, but who knows. And so... Um, it was, it was a dire situation that Nineveh was in. They, they were in a 
in an unfamiliar context for a, a, an empire as powerful as they typically were. Now we need to keep in mind that even though the Assyrian Empire was wicked and pagan and vicious and justifiably disdained as a world superpower by Jonah and the Israelites, that the empire was composed of individual people. So every uh, Assyrian person was not necessarily representative of the Assyrian empire. God had created every Assyrian individual person in the exact same way that he had created every Israelite individual person, with great love in his own image and seeking their welfare. Now, they were born in sin and depravity, just like the Israelites were and just like we are. But every person was important to God. And if I think about kind of the, the broad, broad scale versus the, the micro scale, the macro to the micro, they had households that were not very far removed from our households this morning. So you woke up and, and maybe you had kids and um, sons and daughters, little kids. I have a three-year-old son, Samuel. And he wakes up and he walks in and he's holding his blanket and his, he's in his PJ mask uh, PJs, and he walks in and he looks at me and he goes, Daddy, I hungry. I mean, he's just like this sweet little boy. He just wants to know, okay, when can we eat? What are we doing today? What's, what's on the list of things to do? He doesn't know, the, the, jumping back to Assyria, the Assyrian kids that are like this, they didn't know that there were these military raiding parties going in and doing these terrible things to another country. There were people in Assyria that needed desperately to know who God is. And so God was calling Jonah to go and represent him in a very compassionate way to people who desperately needed to be saved from their circumstances. Who desperately needed to be saved from joining in with the culture and being indoctrinated into the Assyrian culture that was wicked and evil and full of mayhem. Every Assyrian was not the empire, but every Assyrian had been created in the image of God. And God desired Jonah, who was nearer to him, to call out to those individuals and call them to repentance and to draw them near to himself. Why would God do that? Well, Peter tells us in the New Testament, because God is patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so God sent Jonah out of a fairly wicked culture into another fairly wicked culture with the message of salvation. And that's something that they desperately needed. So in the book of Jonah, what we learn about is an unwilling missionary. An unwilling missionary. And the book of Jonah is not a commentary on Nineveh or the Assyrian Empire or their culture. Rather, it's an indictment of Jonah. It's an indictment of a member of God's chosen nation, the nation that he had revealed himself to most fully, most clearly, most explicitly. And so when you read the book of Jonah, think of it as setting up a contrast. You have Jonah, who is uh, supposed to be the protagonist, who's very flawed, and then the foil to Jonah that shows us his flaws is the Assyrian Empire or the Ninevite people. So it's only incidental that this was Assyria. It could have been any wicked, ungodly nation. But God had orchestrated things in such a way that it was Assyria. And through this comparison, we see Jonah's faults because the matter at hand is disobedience of, of one of God's people. We would expect the pagan nations to be disobedient, but what's being highlighted is the disobedience of one of God's own people. And in chapter 1, we see this just constantly Reiterated. So in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the Lord says to Jonah, Arise and go to Nineveh. But Jonah arose and he fled from the Lord's presence. He didn't just stay put and say, Lord, I'm not going to Nineveh. No, he actually wanted to flee from God's very presence. And then in chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, the pagan sailors find themselves in peril. God sends a storm down on the ship that uh, Jonah had boarded. And they cry out to their gods while Jonah refuses to cry out to the Lord for his own or even his host's salvation. He is willing to take these guys with him. 
This is how bad he wants to flee. This is how much he's disobeying the Lord. And then in verses 7 through 15 of chapter 1 of Jonah, the pagan sailors desperately seek peace with God. They find out that it is Yahweh of Israel who had sent this storm, and they desperately want peace with this almighty God, while Jonah would rather be thrown overboard than engage with the Lord. They say, why don't you cry out to your God? And he says, well, we're not really on speaking terms right now. And so uh, it it would be better, it would be safer for you if you just chuck me off the side of the ship because I ain't talking to that guy. I refuse. And so they say, Lord, forgive us. Don't hold this against us. We know it's not not what you would want, but uh, your guy here says chuck him overboard, and and so we're going to do it. And then in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, the pagan sailors, this is their change of attitude. They feared God, they offered sacrifices to God, and they committed themselves to God with vows. And so we have the picture of the pagan sailors who committed themselves with vows to do God's will. And then we have Jonah who would rather be tossed overboard than to do God's will. So Jonah um, had to be literally seized by God. God sent the great fish to swallow him up. And so uh, the way I think about it is kind of a big, fishy, smelly straitjacket got put on the guy. God would not let him run anymore. And he had to be seized by this fish and carried down into the depths of the sea. And he spent a full 72 hours in this condition before he would finally turn and listen to God and respond to God. And there in chapter 2... Verses 7 through 9, we see Jonah finally repenting and submitting to God's will after all of that. And Jonah, in this prayer of chapter 2, he says, When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. So he's saying, My prayer rose up from my circumstances into your presence in your heavenly temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope for steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. So he finally turns around and he says, Lord, I will gratefully do your will. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And for anybody who has come out of a type of especially flagrant or egregious life of sin and their lives have been turned around, just totally 180, it's monumental change, I think we can all... Uh, understand what happened here to Jonah in chapter 2 and verse 10. We might feel that we've been spit out the same way. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. We look back behind us, and we see kind of the ugliness and the disgustingness and the everything that we've left behind, and we find ourselves now graciously rescued from God, having submitted to His will, having given ourselves over to Him, and now suddenly we're standing on solid ground. And we have a mission to accomplish. We have meaning and hope in life that transcends all those other things that we thought were going to make us happy and fulfill us. And now we look back with disgust on how how far we had fallen. And it's easier to fall than we sometimes think it might be. So Jonah finds himself standing on dry ground, and now he's finally ready to go forth and do the thing that God called him to do. Now, chapter 3 is one one record, just one example of what may happen uh, when the simple message that God has given us is simply proclaimed. Without any kind of flourishing, without adding our own cunning to it, without adding any trappings or anything that we think, bells and whistles that we think will make it more plausible or acceptable or compelling, God says, just go forth and tell the people this. And that's exactly what Jonah did. He had a very simple message for the people. And there in chapter 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. So Jonah showed up, 
and he preached this very simple message, and it's a remarkably consistent message. The one that was preached during the Old Testament is remarkably consistent through the ages up through today. And we can fast forward from Jonah's time, about 800 years, and we find another man who's now walking, instead of walking into Nineveh, this man is walking into Galilee, which, remember, is Jonah's old stop, stomping grounds. And this man is proclaiming the same message to the Israelites in Galilee that Jonah proclaimed to the Ninevites in Assyria. And we can look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, for instance. And here is the account of this man. Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jonah walked into Nineveh. He was bringing the kingdom of God into this foreign territory. He says, God is coming near to you, and it is time to repent of your wicked ways. Believe in this message that God has sent you. And Jesus preached the very same message to his own people 800 years later. And we preach the very same message to our culture 2,000 years after that. God has been nothing but consistent in revealing exactly what he wants from people. And when we are willing to humble ourselves, decrease so that he might increase, and just stick to the meat and potatoes of the message of the gospel, we don't need to make it to where people believe it more easily. We don't need to simplify it so they can understand. We don't need to, to put a bunch of bells and whistles on it and dress it up or do some kind of bait and switch with prosperity and all these things and, and well-being. And, and those in our midst know life is not easy just because you're a Christian. But eternity is promised when you're a Christian. And in that place, in the immediate presence of God, the temporary difficulties of this life will seem like nothing. And that is what we look forward to, and that is the message that we preach. And as we were reminded uh, in the men's fellowship, which was such a blessing to me, I'm very grateful, thankful to be a part of it, then we walk with Christ. Salvation is the beginning of the Christian life. Conquering this world for Christ, while being personally sanctified, is the rest of the story. And so here this man walks in, he finally took action in God's name, and there was a definite reaction. When the people of Nineveh, Nineveh heard the call to repent or be destroyed, they responded immediately and mightily. The entire nation, up to the very king himself, the king said, Hey, I finally heard this message, and now I'm going to mandate that the entire nation participate in this repentance. They believed they fasted, they lamented, they repented, they threw themselves upon the mercy of God. When I feel uh, unable or unfit for God's service, I throw myself upon His mercy. I am certain that God has, has called me into this position, um, one, because of the, just the subjective calling of God, but two, because He has prospered us in it. He's taking care of us every step of the way. It has not always been easy, but he has always been there for us. And I throw myself on the mercy of God. I say, Lord, I know you have called me, but I don't know why you called me. I have no clue why I deserve to get to play this part in the kingdom of Almighty God. And we should all be humbled. We should all be humbled that we have been welcomed in and then given this amazing commission to go out and actually serve and be world changers. I throw myself when I feel like, God, I'm just rotten to the core. I mean, I know myself better than I know anybody. And if I know myself, I know that there are many days where I'm not fit for this service. And so all I can do is admit it and throw myself upon God's mercy. And he shows me grace. I don't have to carry around a heavy burden of, of being ineffectual because he's given me a, a, just a simple thing to do. Proclaim the gospel. Teach the Bible. It's all there in front of you. Just lay it before people. And he says, I will be the one to change hearts. I will be the one to transform lives. All you have to do is go and preach. 
And here is an example of what happens. They believed, they fasted, they lamented, they repented, they threw themselves upon the mercy of God. Chapter 4, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. <laughs> All right, Jonah, we finally got you out of the belly of the fish, but apparently you're uh, still not getting it. In uh, the new Jesus Revolution film that just came out, uh, that film tells the story of the Jesus People movement and the hippies that were being evangelized out in California and coming into Chuck Smith's little congregation. And it was a small congregation. It was kind of a sick congregation. It was, it was weak and getting weaker. And there's a scene in the movie where one of the old-timers is sitting in church and all the hippies are sitting in church and he stands up having those hippies in his midst. And if anybody in here was a hippie, I'm not being down on hippies. If anybody in here is a hippie, I'm not being down on hippies. But he looked at those people in his midst, and he got up to walk out of church. And he stopped at one of his buddies, one of the other people, and, and he said, well, you coming along with me? And that one stood up. Except he went the opposite direction. He goes and sits down with, with the group of hippies. And he sat down and he said, preach, pastor. Undoubtedly, this man who was ready to get up and walk out on everybody else had been praying for revival. Undoubtedly, he had been praying that the word of God would go forth with power. Undoubtedly, he was praying that lives would be changed and souls would be saved for eternity. But in that moment, when the people came in that didn't look like the kind of people that he wanted to spend eternity with in heaven, he was willing to get up and walk out on all of them. And so there again, Jonah is not very far removed from our context today. Think about the disparity between Jonah's position and his attitude. The, the difference between his position and his attitude. Jonah was born into Israel in the first place. That was totally beyond his control. That was a gracious gift of God to have him born into that nation at that time. To be one of God's chosen people was just simply a gracious outflowing of God's loving mercy and kindness towards Jonah. So in the first place, he was born into Israel. He was called into God's service. He was saved by the fish. He was given opportunity to repent. He was set on solid ground. He was successful in his mission. He was covered by the plant for shade. When he went up on the, on the hillside to watch what would happen to Nineveh, he sat under a plant that gave him shade from the burning sun. All of these blessings, it was all solely due to God's unilateral exercise of compassion. And yet Jonah did not want to return that compassion. He did not want to reflect that compassion to the world around him. He was angry. Chapter 4, verse 2 tells us why he was angry. Here's the reason. Speaking to God, he says, You are gracious, God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. And you just think about the absurdity. Like, you think about saying those words with anger towards God. I mean, you can even amp it up a little bit. Well, God, I'm mad at you because you are so gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. How dare you, God? I mean, it's just, it's absurd that he would find himself in that position. But we have to be careful. Jonah is a person just like we're, per we're persons, people, created in God's image, prone to forget ourselves sometimes. And look especially at that phrase, abounding in steadfast love. The word translated as abounding is the same one used in Jonah 1, chapter 1 and verse 6. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, go out to your God. So the, the word captain is the same word that is translated abounding. And so what we learn is that God is the chief or the captain of steadfast love. And that word steadfast love is the Hebrew word chesed. And that's the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word agape. That means the self-giving, self-sacrificial, other-seeking, super abundant outpouring of love that God gives to this world. It's the kind of love that we see exhibited on the cross of Christ. Abounding, the chief, the captain. So Jonah was aware that the Lord is the highest, greatest, utmost, chiefest 
in superabundant, overflowing, steadfast, self-giving love. And Jonah had experienced all of it. He had received it and profited from it. But he stubbornly refused to reflect it. Let's turn together, and as we're going to draw this to a close, and let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verses 9 through 11. And this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And he says this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so, over the course of the past several days, we've talked about the fact that we need to hold fast. We need to make sure that we're drawing lines, that we're defending the hills that God has given us, and that we are not giving ground. So yes, hold fast and be willing to stand firm and not give ground to God's enemies. And then last night, we said, be shrewd. And so, yes, be shrewd, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, and leverage everything for the gospel. But if if we were to be unbalanced and we were to accentuate, hold fast, and be shrewd, then what we would be prone to do is fall into an adversarial us versus them, people against people mindset. And so while we do need to take a stand and while we do need to use everything that we have to, to leverage it for the kingdom of God and the influence of the kingdom of God on this world right now, we also need to constantly remember who it is that God is pursuing. And we need to reflect the same compassion that God has reflected for us. And as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he's reminding them that they are really not set above those to whom they minister. So thinking back to the the introduction now, hopefully I can draw that together and make it make sense. A moth cannot actually be a butterfly. A moth can mimic and strain and and try as hard as a moth wants, but it would require a supernatural act of God to make a moth into a genuine butterfly. And so if us butterflies want to maintain a compassionate outlook on others, we need to remember that we used to be moths too. And we need to look at Jonah and, and Uh, We talk about the Bible being a mirror in which we see ourselves clearly, uh, warts and all. We need to, to allow God to teach us what is displeasing to him so that we might be further sanctified, that we might further reflect his image to the world, and so that people might be drawn not to us and not to our methodologies, but to him. And compassion, exhibiting the compassion of God, is one of the surest ways to draw people to him. But we are more like Jonah than we would like to admit oftentimes. And we are more like the guy in the, in the church, at Chuck Smith's church, than we would like to admit sometimes. And we need to be constantly on guard, and we need to be constantly guarding one another about these things to make sure that we are exhibiting the compassion and the care for all of those individuals out there. Yes, they might be lumped into some group, some political party, some, uh, some special interest movement, whatever it might be. But that movement is not the people. The people are the ones that God is seeking to save. And so it doesn't matter what ism they belong to. What matters is that God wants to seek them out and to see them saved. And they will be saved when the church remembers that we are a body of compassionate believers. We need to remember that we used to be moths. And the only reason that we're able to see and proclaim the kingdom of God to a world that is blind in their sin is because God has opened our eyes. John 3, 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we're dealing with blind people 
that need to be born again. How are people born again? They hear the gospel. The Spirit of God enters into their lives. He enters into their hearts and he takes a stony dead heart and he turns it into a living heart of warm flesh and he wakes them up. He opens their eyes. He gives them ears to hear and he brings life where death once reigned. And all we have to do is with compassion share that simple message and then be willing to live together that we might build one another up into maturity into him who is the head, into Christ Jesus. I love what Jonah said there in chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. It's worth repeating. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so what I want to leave you with this morning is, I want to say, may we take Jonah's experience as a cautionary tale and invite the Spirit of God to do an audit of our own personal accounts this morning. It's always good to keep short accounts. And we can sing along with the psalmist who wrote these words. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If we want a renewed church, if we want revival, broad scale in this world, then we need to start at home. We need to open ourselves up fully to God. Let His light shine through every nook and cranny of our hearts, every shadowy place, so that anything that would keep us from the showing compassion to the world as they need to hear it, would be completely annihilated by the love of God. And so that we can go out and just simply share this simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Lord, we're grateful for the time we get to spend together here. And once again, I just ask that anything that was useless would be quickly forgotten. Uh, anything that was useful, we would give you the glory for, and we would implement, that we would apply your word to our lives, that we would begin at home. Uh, judgment begins here in the church. And, and so, Lord, help us to keep short accounts with you. Help us to see that every word of the Bible is good for reproof and rebuke and encouragement. And so, Lord, help us to be those who are compassionate towards outsiders, who, yes, are steady and firm, who, yes, are shrewd and wise, but also, Lord, above all, are compassionate towards those who simply stand where we once stood. Lord, we love you and we seek to honor you with all that we think, say, and do. Would you guide us and direct us, lead us and protect us, and help us to glorify you with our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.